take this code and cut it. I think I cut too much. And then I will create my own function. So I think I did that right. I just cut the code out of the button and I put it in its own function. And now, what do I do? I simply call that function from the onClick event. How do you call the function? Simply by putting the name of the function in. I, my hands are not doing what I want them to do today. All right. So, let's see if this still works. This, strictly speaking, is called regression testing. We're making sure we didn't break anything. We make sure we didn't regress. All right, so I'll go in and put in an amount, say it's dine in, average, Calculate. Oh, there we go. Looks like it still works. All right. Now, if we want to, as I said before, we could, and again, there's no real practical reason for doing this, but um, it's nice to kind of show, uh, you know, uh, an example of it anyhow. I can go and I can put another button on here. You know, at the top of the form, imagining that this is a very long form, or I can calculate, and what I can do is I can, from that button, do the exact same thing. If is valid, calculate tip. So reusable. If you can imagine the way it looked before. The way it looked before, I'd have to duplicate that whole block of code in the button uh, to event um, that was in the, the original button. So now this works. So I can go in here and click either button. I can click that button and get the amount. Or I can click that button and get the amount. Alright. So we made a reusable. We can call from either of those two buttons on that page. So that's the step forward. Alright. One thing that we're going to find, one the conclusion that we're going to come to, is that the code and the code behind, specifically the code on the button click events, there's not going to be a lot there. All right, these, this code is going to be very straightforward. This code's job is simply to connect the user interface to the business logic. All right? um, and if you think about it, I'm not too concerned about that code being reusable, right? Because it, it, it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be, it needs to be tied to the user interface. If its job is to connect the user interface with the business logic, then it better handle the user interface correctly. It better be able to, to work with the user interface. So it's okay if the code here is coupled to the user interface. So the code here is going to be just really sort of glue code. It just glues together our business logic and our um, and our uh, user interface. Okay. Questions?
questions about that step? We made a little improvement, but we haven't improved as much as we could. All right? Why have we not improved as much as we could? Because what if, for example, And again, keep in mind that I'm, I'm really just contriving um, examples. Let's say I actually had two forms on this page. Um, a form up here to do calculation and a form down there to do calculation. All right, for whatever reason. All right. And when I pressed one button, I want to get the value from one set of form controls. And when I pressed a different button, I wanted to get the values from a different set of form controls. All right. Maybe, for example, I had on the top of the page a quick tip calculator where you put in just the amount of the, uh, of the meal and you didn't select whether it was carry out or dine in, it assumed that dine in, and you didn't, it didn't uh, select level of service, that you it just assumed that it was average. All right. This solution wouldn't work for that. If I had two forms on the same page, maybe a quick tip calculation and then the comprehensive tip calculation because while I've improved the coupling a little bit, this function is still coupled to the user interface. It's still grabbing the values from the dropdown. It's still grabbing the values from the specific text box, not drop down, but radio buttons, all right? And it's still grabbing the values from the checkbox. So we've improved it a little bit. It's not coupled specifically to the button, but it's still coupled to those particular screen items. So if I were, were to go and put a quick tip calculator here, all right, then I won't be able to, to get it to work. All right. We'll do that, in fact. I'll remove the validations, because one problem that we're going to run into is a validation, but I'll get rid of those so that we don't. And then we'll look at, um, we'll look at what I mean uh, in a second here. So, how do we further decouple this? We decouple this by making our function more of a black box. All right. Now, black box is a term, I think, from electrical engineering. Um, does anyone have an idea what is meant when you say something's a black box? It's all grounded. It's all as a base. Okay. Those things are true. All right. But specifically about a black box. Yes. It provides some function, but you can't see inside to see how yeah. it does it. it. It's called a black box. Actually, uh, you know, a... a, a solid box or something like that. Non-opaque box would probably be, be better. Or, or opaque. I forget what opaque means. Does it mean clear or not clear? Anyhow. Okay. You, you can't see inside of it. A black box has known inputs and known output. Alright? And you don't really know what it does, but you know that it does some particular job, and if you need it, you plug it in. Alright? In a way, if you think of hardware components, it's kind of like that, right? I may not know, like, what goes on inside this mouse, all right? In fact, this is uh, an optical mouse. It has a little laser, and you can move it around, and it moves the mouse pointer. Some of the, some of the mice have, uh, the old-fashioned ones have the trackball, and you move that around and all that. To the computer, though, that's a black box. As long as this has a plug-in that I can plug into the computer, all right, the computer doesn't like, need to know, is this a trackball mouse? Is this a, a laser pointer mouse? The mouse does its job and communicates through that plug-in and communicates in a consistent way with other mice. So it can, it can be plugged in any, any place you need it. You don't need to know the details of it. Likewise with monitors. Is it a giant monitor? Is it an old tube monitor? Whatever. You don't know what's going on inside of it. You just need to make sure the interface to it works, that you can take and plug in. 
speakers. Am I plugging in speakers or am I plugging in headphones? Don't matter. Does it have the right headphone jack? Does it have the right inputs and outputs? So a black box is like that. A black box is where you have some functionality that gets performed where that function is given everything it needs in the form of an argument. All right? So whatever it needs to do its job, it's given as an argument. And then it returns the answer. So let's think that through, the advantage of, of doing it this way. The advantage of doing it this way is it doesn't matter where the values come from. It could come from, the values could come from a new text box that we have here, or this text box. The values could be defaulted. I could default the values to uh, average service and dine-in. All right. Or they could come from the text box, or radio buttons, or drop-downs, or however I change the form. So we're going to write the function so it doesn't matter where the values come from, as long as we give the function what the values are. So we're decoupling that code from the user interface. Our code right now is tightly coupled to the user interface, still, because this code depends on the value being on it in a text box called txt bill. That's not good. We can't then grab the value from another text box and give it to this. All right. So what we do is we change this function to get uh, any value it needs via an argument. All right. The second part of a black box is in addition to having known inputs, it has a known output. You give these values, this is what you get. And with the function, I, I, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't say if this holds true in, in electrical black boxes or not. But with a function, it can return one value, a single value. Now, we can talk about this more later because it can return a complicated value. It can return an object, but it can only return one value. All right. So we're going to change this to, and think of the value as the final answer. What is the tip that we calculated? We can return that to the user interface. Then the user interface can do whatever it wants to with it. So we could have five different labels on the screen for the tip. All right. We could um, change so that we create a tip chart, for example. You put in the amount and it creates a table that says if the service was good or if the service was poor, this is your tip amount. If it was average, this is your tip amount. If it was excellent, this is your tip amount. We can, if, if we decouple that from the user interface, we can take the answer and do whatever we want to with it. So let's look at this here. What are we doing with the answer in this function? We're plopping it in this label. It's the only thing we can do with the answer right now with that function. Is that function is coupled tightly to this user interface. We can only put that answer in this label. If we change to allow a return value, then when you press the button, you get your answer. Then it's up to the code behind to decide what to do with that answer. It's up to the little glue code, all right, that's going to glue this business logic function to our user interface to decide where it's getting the values and what it's going to do with those values. All right. So it, the, the function itself will be not coupled uh, to uh, the user interface. All right. So how do we do that? First thing we do is we can change this from protected void to protected double. What does that mean when I say protected double? For that matter, what did it mean when I said protected void? Protected void means it doesn't return anything. All right? It would be in VB, if you're familiar with VB, that would be what's called a subroutine in VB. And there's no, you know, both of them are functions in, in C-sharp. 
So now, you know, this word here specifies the return value. And like I said, you can only return one thing. You can return nothing, or you can return one thing. In this case, I'm saying I'm returning a double. Why am I returning a double? Because that's what my tip is going to be. My tip is a double. All right? So I'm returning a double. So the return value, think of it as a final answer. It's the, fun it's the value that your function is, or is the answer to the, to the question that you're asking of the function. So if the question is, what is the appropriate tip? Then the return value is going to be the tip. All right, the amount of the tip. That's the answer to the question that we're asking. And what's the data type of the tip? It's a double. All right? If we were doing whole numbers only, we could make that an N, or there's other options, but a double is a good one for tip because, again, it allows for decimals, it's appropriate range, and so on. Now, what ingredients do we need to calculate the tip? What does this black box need to know to calculate the tip? What are the parameters it needs to know? The bill and the level of service. Anything else? Oh, carry out. Yeah, whether it's carry out or dine in. All right. That's the three ingredients that we've defined as being part of how you calculate what the tip is. This function needs to know, well, how much was the bill for? Um, it needs to know, well, how good was the service? And finally, it needs to know, well, was it carry out or dine in? If you give those three things, the tip calculator does its thing and gives you the answer. You know, think if you called someone on the phone and asked them, I'm at a restaurant, how much tip should I leave? What are they going to say? First of all, they'll probably say, quit bothering me with these stupid questions. But after they do that, they'll say, okay, well, well how much was your bill? You know, well, you know. What restaurant is it? Did, did you eat there? Is it a McDonald's? You know, or did you eat in somewhere? And then finally, you know, well, how good was the service? So that's the reasonable questions that they would ask. So the parameters to this function or the arguments to the function are going to be the things that the function needs to know to do its job. And those also have associated with them a data type, right? Because in one case, The amount of the bill is a double, all right? The level of service is a string. And then finally, the dine-in or carry-out is also a string, all right? So we need to give this a double and two strings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a double Arg bill, all right. a string, arg service, and another string, arg, another string, arg, dine in. That's what That's what this needs, this function needs to do its job. These are the inputs to it. All right? The output's going to be a double. So, when we write this function now, we're not going to grab the value from those specific places on the screen. All right? So, let me get rid of some of these variables. And I'm going to change the, this code to use the arguments. So, for example, I'm not grabbing the value from the radio button, right? I am grabbing the value from my argument. So, how do I know if it's dying in or not? Well, this function gets past it. All right. All right. 
So when I call this function, we have to give it the amount of the bill, the level of service, and whether it was dine-in or not. Okay? So how does this function know if it's dine-in or not? That's one of the arguments that gets passed. All right? Think in terms of Excel. You know, there's a square root function. You know, if you put the square root function in there, square root of what? Well, you have to point to the cell and tell Excel where to get the value that you want the square root of. I want the square root of cell B2. All right? There's not a separate function for every cell to calculate the square root. There's one square root function that does its thing, and that function gets an argument, namely, what cell do you want the square root of? And then it does its thing, and it uses the value of, this, uh, of that cell. Same thing here. There's going to be one calculate tip function that we pass in the form of arguments everything that that function needs. The bill, the level of service, and whether it's dine in or not. Okay. So if our dine in equals D, then we don't need to do that anymore because we're not pulling those from the form. We're going to use our service here. equals P. All right. Arg service equals A. And we're not pulling the value of the bill from the form. We're getting past that. Arg bill. Then finally, we don't know for sure that that's where we want to put the answer. So therefore, we're not going to put the answer right there. We're simply going to return the answer. So instead of saying, hey, that, that, that label gets set to this, I'm just going to say return double tip. So now this function is a black box. This function doesn't refer to anything on the form. All right? Anything that this needs to do its calculation, it gets passed via an argument. What does it need? It needs a level of service. It needs whether it was dining or not. And it needs the amount of the bill. When it's done calculating the answer, it gives the answer to whoever called it and is done with it. All right? Think of, again, I, I, I think it's good, and sometimes when you're developing software, you have people play the role of functions and objects. But if there was a shipping object, um, maybe you would ask the shipping object, how much would it cost to overnight a two-pound package to Boston? The shipping package would do, uh, the, the shipping uh, object would do its thing and come up with an amount and say, cost $26. All right. Now, the program may look and say, or the person that's, you know, asking the shipping clerk may look and say, well, $26, is, is, that costs too much. I'm not going to overnight it then. I'm going to send it second day or whatever. But it's not up to the shipping object to decide that. The shipping object just answers the question. Whoever called, whoever asked the shipping object, takes that information and does what it needs to do with it. Maybe then, you know, you're going to go and say, yeah, okay, well, I'll ship it, charge my account $26. Or maybe you'll say, no, nah, too expensive, we'll ship it some other way. All right, so we've created our function that is truly a black box. It doesn't refer to anything from the outside world, the outside world being elsewhere on this page. We now have to call it. All right, question? Could you go to the lowest part? All right, we now have to call it. All right. So, this function now has a little bit harder job, the onClick event. We're not going to give it any real work here. It's not going to do any of the calculation. But, as a calling, as a code that calls this function, it's responsible for two things. Number one, it's responsible for gathering up everything 
that the function needs. So it is responsible for, for finding out and filling those arguments. Then it's responsible for calling the function, and then it's responsible for doing something with the results. So I guess that there's three things it's responsible for. So one thing that this has to do is Where am I going to get the level of service? I'm going to get it from radio button. No, not the dine-in one. Drop-down service. Dot. Selected value. Where do I get the value of whether it's dine-in or not? STR dine-in equals rb dynan dot selected value. Oops. I now call the function. Alright. Now, how do I call the function? We can gather from the little squiggly line that this isn't enough. Why not? Because now there's parameters to that function. So I have to give Double bill. String service. I have to give values for each of the arguments respectively. And the order and the type have to match. So it's expecting the bill to be first in a double, the service to be second in a string, and the dine-in to be third in a string. So now I go and do that. All right, so now I'm calling the function. Now, this function is going to do its thing and return an answer. I have to grab that answer so I can do something with it. Right? Therefore, I'm going to say double tip answer equals that. So now I have the answer in a double. All right? I have to put it where it belongs. Label tip dot text equals double tip answer to string. All right. So you might look and say, gee, I thought you said we're not going to have a lot of code in the button click event. Well, we don't really. We just have a little bit of code, and all this click event is responsible for is gathering up.